This is the second part of the section, the screencast here on food and health. We're going to be looking at Alaska in this context here. And we'll start off by looking at the economics of food access within the state of Alaska in terms of production, distribution, and exchange and consumption. Now, you might recognize this from economics, but also from economic anthropology. These are the three phases of economic activity. In terms of the production aspect and the aspect of subsistence, there is a heavy reliance on subsistence foods, the foraging, uh, hunting, and fishing, and gathering, particularly in rural Alaska. As with many states in the United States, Alaska agriculture will supply less than 5% of the food requirements for the individuals living within that state. And because of the integration within the larger economy, we also see a fair amount of dependence on processed foods, and these being shipped in or distributed and exchanged in the area. In terms of distribution and exchange, there are a number of traditional mechanisms which allow for uh, the materials, the food resources, the subsistence resources in particular, to be shared, particularly between youth and elders and in other contexts as well. We also see distribution and exchange uh, through gift exchanges in, in the context of ceremonial exchanges as well, and commodity exchanges in the context of, uh, of trade in stores uh, and airplanes and these types of things from rural areas into the urban centers of Alaska. Finally, in terms of consumption, we have to consider the overall situatedness of Alaska Natives within the state as a whole, and food security issues um, with 12% of households reporting some food insecurity over the course of the year and 5% reporting severe food insecurity. And severe food insecurity would be marked by things such as children having to skip meals. We would also consider aspects of nutrition in terms of what actually constitutes good food for individuals' perceptions as well as dietary requirements, and then look at, uh, look at safety issues, particularly issues of contamination surrounding uh, traditional foods. And now the Arctic is a site of much bioaccumulation due to both the uh, currents of ocean as well as air currents, which actually lead to a lot of deposition of heavy, heavy metals as, radio, as well as radionuclides. Uh, in Arctic environments, and of course this is not isolated to uh, Alaska, probably the Lap or another fine example of this as well. Uh, the Inuit, uh, much of the um, Arctic regions uh, as a whole uh, have and, and actually bear quite the burden of uh, industrialization uh, in production processes throughout the world. So living in the so-called Bush Alaska or the traditional food system, uh, of uh, Alaska Native peoples. Now we're talking about Alaska Natives, we're talking about several different cultural groups, and even within these cultural groups we see a fair amount of diversity uh, in terms of cultural forms and languages. Um, so we're talking about the Inuit, Athabascan, Aleut, Klingit, Simshian, uh, the Haida, and others. Um, the uh, many of these communities are very isolated uh, from what you would see in the so-called lower 48 or the, uh, the continental United States. Uh, and so what this means is there are not any roads that are service, servicing these villages, uh, these rural communities. So the, any, any type of transportation would be by either air um, or by barge uh, on a maybe annual, uh, potentially semi-annual basis. We're talking about village communities uh, with, with uh, 50 uh, or less, uh, 50 or, or, or so people up to uh, uh, a little bit less than 600. And in these different communities, because there's a fairly spread out geography uh, ge in a geographical context, you have a fair amount of diversity of potential uh, foods that are available. Um, caribou, moose, musk ox, bison, salmon, whitefish, pike, walrus, whale, seal, waterfowl, as well as potentially uh, gardens. Now, Along with this, we see a, a fair amount of seasonal as well as annual flexibility. In other words, these are not resources that are guaranteed or foods that will be there all the time. Um, and indeed, different Alaska Native peoples have engaged in what's called a seasonal round, where they'll participate in various aspects of subsistence in particular locations that will vary depending on the time of year. What those also vary on is the particular year itself. So it might be a really good year for salmon runs, for example, 
um, in, in some settings, but not in others. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is, uh, much like with the Arizona case and the Autumn case, we see that the first trading posts uh, did provide a little bit of measure against uh, of security against hunger in a, at a very base level in terms of calories uh, overall. Now, there are also issues of that in terms of substitution of these foods uh, overall. Um, so looking at traditional or country foods and health, um, Molly Lee in her 2002-2003 piece, The Cooler Ring, highlights uh, uh, a woman named Flora Mark who she traces from Anchorage to rural communities and she goes with day-old donuts to these communities and she shares them with them in exchange for the traditional foods. And so this is a way that Flora can still access traditional foods and live in the urban environment of Anchorage, Alaska. And Molly Lee follows her around um, as she's engaged uh, in this exchange uh, of foods. Food sharing allows for cultural continuity. Uh, it allows in that context for information to be shared, knowledge to be shared, uh, to be passed down. Uh, this is tied fundamentally into ideas of identity and, as well as health. And so when individuals are sharing food in, in any cultural context, there is certainly a physical aspect of that in terms of the nourishment of food, in terms of the nutrients in the food. Uh, there are a lot of emotional and potentially spiritual connections with particular types of foods. Um, you can think about this in a variety of different contexts, uh, holiday contexts where you've eaten particular types of foods and how this might be associated with things like community uh, or like family. Uh, for Alaska Natives as well as Native American peoples, you see a lot of interconnections here and spiritual connections with the idea of the health of the individual, the health of the community, uh, and the health of the animals as well, as well as the plants and the environment as a whole. So this idea of this holistic uh, interconnection of these things uh, overall. Much like in the case of the Tana Otham, uh, many Alaska Natives look at the country foods as a way to confront contemporary health problems. That is, going outside and being active, um, collecting these foods, participating in subsistence activities which are traditional, which relate to different uh, traditions, uh, different myths, different stories uh, about the importance of the animals, and indeed different ways of being with the animals, uh, being with the animals and the plants, the proper way to be a person. And Anne Finnett Reardon in particular talks quite a, a bit about this. Uh, unfortunately, as was previously noted, many Alaska Native peoples have to confront issues of contamination and in, in terms of the traditional foods. And so now this becomes a cost-benefit analysis, whether it's worth it to consume uh, many of these traditional foods, particularly in the case of fish uh, and methylmercury in fish. And this is uh, Jocelyn Cassidy's work in Medical Anthropology Quarterly and in other locations, if you're interested in that. So if we look at Bush, Alaska, so-called Bush, Alaska in context, we have one in five families living well below the poverty line with a per capita income of $12,000. This, of course, is concentrated in the rural areas, and what we have to consider here, uh, too, is e externally imposed definitions of poverty. And, uh, you know, going back to earlier in the semester, we talked about cultural relativism and ethnocentrism, you know, and how an individual is described as rich or wealthy. And this is, uh, can be relative. And so if one, if the most important thing for individuals is access to food, community, and health, uh, External funds or external money might not necessarily be imperative in order to accomplish this. However, in the mixed subsistence economy in a lot of contexts in Alaska, in Alaska, what is happening is outside sources of income are required in order to do in order to go out and participate in hunting or fishing uh, because one would have to purchase uh, a motor, uh, an outboard motor for a boat, fiberglass boat. One would have to uh, purchase uh, potentially high-powered rifles and uh, snowmobiles, or as it's called uh, there, snow machines. Uh, the best estimates put country foods at somehow between 20 and 30 percent of the income overall. But again, 
this implies some sort of substitutability and indeed if we're talking about the physical health that may be the case but if we're talking about emotional spiritual psychological health we can see that um, bringing in foods from the outside in boxes is not the same as going out and engaging in subsistence activities so we did our research around Fairbanks um, and we were looking at this in 2008 we we're looking at the increase of uh, the price of food since 2005 and some ideas about uh, how individuals in the area were thinking about whether, what type of issue this was. So at least uh, about a quarter said this was a moderately an issue that caused moderate concern for them. Uh, the Fairbanks North Star Borough at the time had uh, less, a little bit less than 100,000 people, uh, about 7% Alaska Native, uh, American Indian, Native American, uh, and 7,444 square miles. The city of Fairbanks, uh, 35,000 people, uh, about 10% uh, uh, American Indian, Alaska Native, uh, widest temperature range of anywhere um, in the uh, states. Uh, so we were looking at uh, issues around food security and what we were um, noting here was uh, the number of customers that were being served, but also an area of concern here was the pounds of food received from the community. Um, and this was looked at as potentially you know, running out of food down the, down the road. So what we did is we went ahead and interviewed individuals um, did semi-structured interviews with people who are food insecure. This were students in economic and political anthropology classes that I had taught at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Um, and what was found was that there was a heavy reliance on a food support network. Um, so like, much like Molly Lee's work on the cooler ring, this idea that individuals would be uh, exchanging uh, goods uh, as well as money with one another. So subsistence foods and money with one another. Uh, and we were also uh, issues of institutional government or non-government support as well as informal exchanges overall. And some of the critiques that we came across, um, not surprisingly, was in, in overall in Fairbanks there was not enough country or traditional foods. And it was really difficult to navigate the, the bureaucracy of the system. Uh, the food boxes themselves, uh, the uh, Fairbanks Community Food Bank, there was too much of certain foods, not enough of other foods, and that justification was needed after four food boxes. 17 of 52 reported use of subsistence food either through self-acquisition or gifting, and subsistence food would be through hunting or fishing or collecting, and they tie in this idea of cultural continuity as well as identity, remembering particular seasons and their importance and what they should be doing during this time in terms of subsistence activity. So as it's getting on towards winter or spring, what should an individual be doing? Uh, there's a lot of idea of the communitarian aspect here, pulling resources, uh, and then certainly the connections between nutritional foods and health were made. Fred, again, these are pseudonyms as in the context of uh, the work in Arizona, uh, notes in an interview, do you get some of your food from hunting? Yes, caribou. And do you know of places to hunt? I do. How far from where you live? You can just give me a range of 100 to 500 miles. I'd say maybe 8 to 1500 miles, maybe round trip, let's say 8 to 800. Uh, do you get some of your food for fishing? Yes. Like what? Herring, salmon, seal, beluga whale. How far is that from where you live? Let's say 600 miles. So this is a Nubiat middle age uh, male. Anna, in talking about food and health, um, and here you see some of the tension here that exists between traditional foods and ideas of health today, um, and much in the case of the Tonotham as well. Uh, the doctors tell our people fat is not good for you, too much cholesterol, and the people still eat moose fat, marrow, uh, but there are some that want to watch their diets, they don't eat fat, and there are others that don't want to eat much native food due to getting sick, they are afraid to eat it since a lot of people from certain areas are getting sick. So this is Anna and Athabaskan, middle-aged female. Um, so in this lecture, we've looked at food and health uh, in general. We've looked at uh, the Native American context of the Tonawatham Nation on the U.S.-Mexico border. Uh, we looked at some of the geography uh, and the economies around the, the Tonawatham Nation, uh, looking at defining traditional uh, foods and what that means, uh, some of the factors and ways to promote traditional foods on the Tonawatham Nation. We also looked at Alaska Natives and their access to foods from the perspective of economic anthropology, food security, and food assistance. Uh, I'd just like to conclude here by thanking uh, many individuals and entities from both Alaska and Arizona, and this is the short list here for sure, uh, that helped me in conducting the research and writing it up and, and presenting on it in a variety of different contexts. Thank you.